This week's was on um, negative identity and its con um, impact on conflict resolution and conflict itself. Um, so the article evaluated what is negative identity, um, how does it contribute to conflict, and then how can you um, work through conflict where there is a negative identity problem. Um, so really this was just kind of a um, more of like a using research and, and kind of evaluating this area. And, um, it was a lot of explaining using examples, um, but he touched a lot on, you know, what is negative identity? What might cause negative identity? What are the issues that it creates um, for that person and then for other groups? Um, he explains why um, negative identity might cause conflict and um, how to work through conflict with it. Um, and then he leaves us with an example um, from the, a story in the Bible, which was Jacob and um, Esau, um, and kind of where negative identity actually played a role in that, um, in that scenario. And also he shows it from, you know, start to finish, how that also came to a resolution standpoint. Um, no, you can go to the next slide. So um, it's important to note that negative identity is defined as holding an identity because one is not like another person or group. Um, so if I'm part of religion X, um, it is because I am not part of religion Y. Um, negative conflict doesn't always, um, but can come from a place of past hurt or experiences. So he does stress that, that often it comes from, it comes from a past of some kind. Um, which is why it's, it's particularly tricky because there's often feelings that are attached to this. There's emotions attached to this. Um, it doesn't, it, I mean, I suppose it could, but it doesn't always just stem just because you just don't want to be like somebody else. There's usually a reason. Um, and he notes that this could be conscious or subconscious. Um, all of these potential factors um, can make conflict arising from negative identity difficult to work through. Um, so asking someone with a negative identity to um, examine themselves may be a way to help resolve a conflict. Um, for instance, if you, um, you know, just try to work through, like, why do you have these feelings? Why, um, why are you against this particular group? Um, why do you hold that identity? So just trying to work through that to get down at like a very, and, and for that person to do it, not for someone else to come in and try to tell them. Um, also is trying to find a shared identity with the, the group that that person is not, um, or being open to listening to that perspective from someone else. They notice a barrier there though is compassion because if you don't, if you're so adamantly against and opposed to said person, it's very hard to be open to that perspective or to have compassion. Um, and so the key takeaway is that willingness is key here. Um, as noted, you know, they have to be willing to examine themselves. They have to be willing to hear another perspective and to be open to possible compassion um, with that person or party. Um, and so it, it can be difficult. And I, I think a key there is trying to figure out ways to engage that person to get them in a place where they are willing to resolve that conflict. Um, but I thought that this, this article was really enlightening in a sense because I thought, wow, like, I mean, we know identity and, and intergroup conflict is so common and there's, you know, we see that in so many different ways with religion or politics or, or various different groups, especially. Um, but it felt like, wow, I mean, that is a, a big thing for some people that it's not about what they are per se, it's what they're not. Um, and I thought that was really fascinating. Was, was this a, th a more like a, it was a theory paper? So it was more like a, like an essay almost? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, 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 so, you know, it's interesting. I have never, I haven't heard this uh, I, way of framing negative identity, but it's like I'm having trouble wrapping my mind around how any identity is not framed in some way as not being a part of another group. Like how, how, how does one even uh, conceive of a group identity without it automatically being perceived as not a, not a part of this other group because like in order to have my group there has to be an opposite right can i can i actually ask something about that too maybe maybe that'll you can clarify it too but i i had a, i had an example that popped up when when you were talking about this and i wonder if it fits um we're like so 
uh, last year when the Dodgers were in the World Series, my my mom is a is a, just a crazy Giants fan, San Francisco, um, and and Dodgers and Giants are very like in California, very much like head to head. Like they're they don't get along. Um, it's very very much there. Um, but for the World Series, the Giants didn't make it. The Dodgers uh, went against the Tampa Bay Rays, and so for for the World Series, my mom was a Tampa Bay Rays fan. She identified with that team because she didn't want to uh, identify with with the Dodgers. Um, and I wonder if that's like somewhat of an example here, as because you're not specifically not like that other group, um, and specifically don't want to be a part of that other group. Um, maybe Natalie, yeah, that's clarify. He actually used an example like that. Um, for regarding sports teams, actually, about if you are such a strong fan for one team, sometimes it's, um, I mean, then there could be various reasons, but sometimes it's um, exactly that. Like if you were versing um, the Yankees and like the Red Sox and the Red Sox win, you know, um, if you are, or if they're playing another team, for instance, yeah, you would root for like the other team because you're so adamantly opposed to the Red Sox if you're the Yankees fan. Um, yeah. So that's literally exactly what he what he gave as an example as, as one of the ways to explain this. Yeah, there's a, I, there's a large there's a large rivalry literature in the sports literature that I think that's getting to this phenomenon, and it's uh, so this so that's interesting. So so really, it's not it's like almost like does part of your identity rely on the idea of being opposed to this group? Is that kind of what it is? Yeah. Yeah, and that's and that was why I think your point was interesting, Jeremy, because I think sorry, there is some distinction between um, what you're saying. Like, you know, if you have an identity, there is some regard of where that is inherently because you're different from, right. from another identity. But I think this is almost focused on a negative aspect of it, that it kind of goes above and beyond just being like different from them. And it's really that you are very opposed or oh, um, okay, or, you know, worse you know like disgusted or something else towards that group um yeah. that you just can't share you share no pieces of a of a shared identity with them which is it's why like they a, oh go ahead oh, go. i was i was it's like it's like having a conflict identity where it's like you are in your I, part of your identity is invested in being in the conflict it's invested in opposing this other group yeah yeah. Yeah, and it reminds me of like allies and and like large scale macro level conflicts where I mean look at like the American Revolution right where the French like sided with the patriots yeah. and you know so they took on that negative identity sort of against the redcoats against the British right you know and I feel like that that talk I mean negative identity happens a lot with macro level conflicts when we look at wars and out al and allyship right and what that looks like or even even just to scale it down a little bit more to our country like race and 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 what's what's going on with all of that right and and this this sort of the the movement that we're seeing now with black lives matter and like the people kind of identifying against the other I feel like that kind of fits into this negative identity too. Well, yeah, I think, I, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know, but my, my take on it is, is like, well, it's like the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? In the, in the ally scenario. Yeah. Which is, but, but, uh, but I don't know. My, I, my take is, I hope that the case is that rate, th this doesn't play into race as much as it does politics, because I don't think people are like that are like, you know, one race is are saying I identify with this race, and part of that identification is that I'm against this other race. It's more like it's I see it more like if I'm a if I'm a if I'm on the left or I'm a Democrat, like I it's partly because I'm against the right, you know, or something like that. I hope it's not the right. I hope it's not yeah, that people think, are actually feeling like I'm against this other race or something. Absolutely. I think where I was kind of going with that was more and I'm thinking out loud here, like as, as a white Sorry. person, we, we kind of don't like looking at race. We've generally speaking, like historically speaking, we haven't identified as a race because we are like white is not a race. I feel like that's been like a common kind of general theme. Now, not everyone fits into that bucket. I'm just generally speaking that we've white, folks have almost 
taken on a negative identity of like we're not part of race and now and and willingness like so back to this article right willingness is key so now you're seeing a lot of awareness building which leads to that willingness for white folks to kind of say like oh I, it's not it's no longer a negative identity it's my identity as a as a white person i too am one of the races right like i, I feel like that's kind of where i was trying to put this fit this article into the conversation about race and um, there is an example that he gives, and I'll just read this from the article really quick. Um, he says, for example, judges or jurors who either consciously or subconsciously hold the positive identity of being a law-abiding citizen may treat criminal defendants differently from those who usually subconsciously hold a negative identity of not being a criminal an identity that may lead them to want to rid society of criminal filth. So on kind of what you're saying, like it can take, I think a really negative side street. It's not that everyone holds that view, right? Like they may even just be on the side of like not being a criminal. They don't all want to get rid of criminal filth though. So I think that there's some level of that with race too. Like some people are just closed off. Some people may take that in a route that's obviously very um, not acceptable, but. I don't know yeah, if that's helpful. I, yeah, no, I, I mean, back, just to point us back to like your takeaway, I think, I think this is a, a strong takeaway. But like the question is, as peace builders, right, as people working in this field, how do we, how do we help others become more willing, right, to 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 find commonalities and and find things. Um, shared shared interests with said other yeah yeah would it would it yeah would it help like a, a helping people explore the the nuances or the complexities of like why they develop this identity why are they why do they feel opposed to this other group and stuff like and i and i think maybe there's also a level of motivation like do you want to get along better do you want to come out of this conflict is there any motivation to do so because it's going to take a little effort for me, the big thing in this is, is really power. So, I mean, if you are the person with the negative identity, but you are the minority and your experience, your, your history, the, you know, has predominantly been that you are not the one that has the power, the influence, um, you're the one that things are acted upon or presumed upon, then the negative conflict is valid to me. If you are, you know, the person or the group that, you know, even in a workplace, if you're the manager or the supervisor, then I don't think the negative identity should be as valid because then I feel like it's something else. It's not just negative identity, because if you're in the majority group or if you're in leadership or in a, in a, a position of power, then I, I just don't feel like that should be called negative identity because I feel like the negative identity they should go to the, you know, the person whom these things have been acted upon so that they have, they have justification for feeling that. Um, and so I keep thinking of one of the peace building cases. There were so many reasons why she felt, she felt insecure, she felt less than, she was highly sensitive to a lot of things, but it was for a lot of reasons. And, and a lot of it had to do with her, her, like I said, her culture, her upbringing, all those things. And, and it, it, the truth of it was, is like she was the only person in her organization that was her ethnicity, but she brought a lot of weight into the situation anyway. And, you know, they, I mean, it just, but she was willing, she was willing to explore that and to look at all that. And she was actually kind of aware of, of some of her insecurities and why, um, but it sort of took her being able to express that to the other members of the group for them to understand why she had been so sensitive, like hyper sensitive about some things. And, sure. um, so, 
well, I don't know. That, so that's what this makes me think of. Is, is In a situation like this, and, and maybe I shouldn't feel this way, but I'm like, if you're the majority and if you have the power and the influence and the position, then I don't think you, you should be allowed to have negative conflict. Then I think it is something else. I think you raise a good point. And what, what I'm taking away from this now, Tony, is, is that trying to prove that one's chosen identity or, or whatnot is a negative identity is nearly impossible. You don't know you how how are you how are you to illustrate that how one is viewing themselves is defined as a negative identity unless you're like asking the questions like the study clearly did, right? But in the in in the real world and the work that we're doing, like your your the situation that you just shared, trying to prove that it was a negative identity, you just can't do that. Like you, we don't know why one is well, and if you can't, if you, this group. I mean, and if you can, if you can, if you get to the point where you say, where basically you, you are basically getting to the idea that you are invested in this conflict because you are invested in being opposed or, or being opposed to this other person or this other group, and you're invested in them being opposed to you, you're investing in that concept of opposition. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and that seems like what the negative identity is, is like, I'm invested in the opposition, the idea of the opposition. You're invested in the conflict. So how do you, okay, so do you want to get out of the conflict? If you want to get, if you want to continue this conflict, if you want to continue to be opposed by them and you oppose like this concept, you know, okay, that's up to you. But if you want like help and you want to get out of the conflict, we've got to start, like, we've got to, you know, there's, there's, there's parts of the real world we have to tackle, but there's also like part of perception. Like we have to start getting on the same team here. We can't just we can't just stay invested in being in the opposition. What's mm -hmm. that going to do? I mean, what do we, what, then what, you know? So, so everybody's mindset, you know, has to change. And I think people in, in power positions, certainly, uh, you know, I think they have, I think people in power positions have to, um, they have to take, they have to take leaders, they have to take charge, like they have to lead the way in terms of being generous with their heart space and compassion. They have to, they have to show that, okay, I'm willing to not be in a position here. I'm going to, I, and I, and make, I'll make the first concession. Cause if you're in a leadership position, if you're in power position, it's, it's, up, I think it's up to you to make that first concession is to say, I'm willing to, to drop this opposition and to get out of conflict. And that hopefully will help the other person go, okay, I'm willing to too, you know? Mm -hmm. I agree, except that a lot of times the leader, I mean, you get to be the leader by being competitive, by, yeah. you know, being stronger, being better. And, right. and, and they're conditioned to be that way. And, you know, survival of it is you're weak. So, you know, huh? Yeah, if, if that's the, if that's the, if that culture promote, you know, promotes that sort of, and there's definitely cultures that promote that sort of attitude. And like that sort of attitude is a winning attitude in that culture. If that's the case, the pro and so like, I think about this and, and you come in, like, let's say you're coming in as a peace builder and you go, how do I get these two people to get along better? Or these two groups, like the IT department and the sales department, sales department, super competitive. They've got more power. They're bringing in more revenue and the IT department is smaller. And there's just a few people and they don't have as much power and what, you know, all this, like, how do I get them to get along? Um, and, and convince the more powerful position, like, hey, if you want to get, a, it's worth getting along, you know, because it'll, it'll help you, it'll help everybody in the long run. And if you want to do that, you probably are going to have to kind of make the first concession, like, you know, just because of the power dynamic. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you how do you come in and, and convince? Because you because you can't come in and say, you you guys are totally in the wrong. They're totally in the right because they're just going to shut you out. Then just like, forget, <laughs> I'm not going to deal with you. You know. So there's got to be some some approach to like help everybody, you know, figure out. Yeah, and I think it starts with a question. It, it starts with asking. Yep. Yeah, and I, I wonder, you know, what stands out to me here is that like the sustainability of a negative identity. Like, you, yeah. someone who's living within a negative identity and that's a primary aspect of who they are for an extended period of time, it's got to 
have negative consequences on them to a degree, like whether it's living in this state of pain and hatred and whatever for so long. Um, and maybe that's a way to, like, especially like in coaching, I imagine, that maybe that's a way you can somewhat appeal to them to kind of rethink things, change perspectives and reframe um, is, you know, are you, you know, do you want to, I, I like I, I can't predict what's going on within you but you know if there's a lot of pain there like you want to keep living within this and can we you know maybe we can try to move on to you know a different way of thinking about this group or you know sh you know working with this group and having shared goals in some way or 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 whatever but I think that's um sustainability I, I feel like just isn't at least in a healthy way it doesn't seem possible to me yeah those, those questions are like helping to build motivation. Like, do you really want to be in this pain? Do you want to continue in this, in this way? Sometimes people just don't have anything else. They need it to feed off of. They need it yeah. to feel motivated. You know, it's, it's what, because they're missing something else in their lives. And, you know, so in, in this in a sense, it's, it's like, you know, this is the charge or this is the thing that, that, you know, gives me something to do, something to think about, something to focus on. I've seen that a bunch of times in, in, in coaching some people at work where it's just like, like, I don't want to give up because if I give up, then like, then who am I? What do I do? Like, I need to be in, I need to be fighting the good fight. If I don't fight this good fight, then who am I? Like that, I've seen, I've felt that in in like coaching people at work when they're in these like long conflicts and they can't get out, they have it's like a real like mindset shift. Like, okay, I'm gonna be someone different. I'm gonna be someone who's not part of this conflict, and it's a, like a it's like an identity shift. Yeah, he does actually bring that up. That challenging a negative identity is in some way sometimes a, like a threat to self for some of these people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I thought it's been very like genuinely very enlightening. It just felt like all of a sudden a light bulb went off about all these different conflicts I could see in society and different places. And that, you know, I guess I never really thought about this being kind of a, a primary reason behind it, but it, I think it is for a lot of, a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. I know we might have exhausted our conversation about this one, but I just la I just want to share this thought because it reminds me of a current client that we're working with and I, I feel as though this person perhaps fits this kind of negative identity, but it, and while we're talking about, you know, this key takeaway of willingness and, you know, examining one's own thoughts and like, why are you choosing that identity? Um, it was just through some questions asked, both written and verbal to this, this individual that just recently made like a 180 shift. I mean, and it was really just the questions asked that caused some introspection. And it, this person, like I said, 180. And, wow. and, 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 and it's, it just goes to show really that the power of a question, right? The, so, the self-awareness that it brings. Yeah. yeah. And, and this, like exactly meeting this where that this person through questions being asked from, from our peace builders, shifted and started and had that willingness like learn that willingness to look within and question themselves and like why they were in this stuck in this position that's interesting well so i am a diehard saints fan but i did pull for the falcons when they were playing the patriots in the super bowl a few years ago and i'm still hurt I am still hurt because they, I, I pulled for them and they are our staunch rivals. I put on a shirt that said Falcons and everything. And they got in that Super Bowl and just. That's, um, that's how my mom felt too when the, the Dodgers won the World Series last year. Um, so <laughs> look, it's a common, common relatable, relatable uh, right. <laughs> phenomenon. <laughs> Because I dislike the Patriots more than the Falcons, but hey. right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a. I think you make a good point, um, Sarah. When you're talking about that, it can be really powerful. Uh, you know, curiosity, asking the right questions. Um, you know, I think can just obviously can change a perspective. And like as you said, it seems like it really made a difference in that um, in that one uh, client's outlook. And I imagine will change the conflict too um, that you're that you're dealing with. 